So you'll have to accept that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we'll make sure that this gets up uh, on the Powered Up Baraboo website uh, as soon as we can. And Torrance has talked about so linking um, to um, uh, <clears throat> the, his website and Facebook page uh, for his organization, which will help get us a little bit more traffic, uh, we're hoping. Um, I think everybody, we've got a pretty small group right now, but I'll go ahead and go through the introduction regardless uh, for the sake of our recording. So my name is Barry Hardup. I'm a member of the Powered Up Baraboo Home and Business Action Team. Uh, we're happy to host uh, tonight's event on energy audits and our speaker, Torrance Kramer. Um, <clears throat> our goal is to, um, uh, the, of our team is to help local residents and businesses reduce their energy use and improve the ability to adapt to coming climate challenges. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, worked to expand uh, a number of uh, things in the community through the, uh, such as the use of LED bulbs um, and <clears throat> other energy saving technologies in, in uh, Baraboo and distributed a list of available programs providing uh, free resources to local residents. And most recently we've uh, <clears throat> completed a brochure on no cost and low cost ways to save energy and money that we're in the midst of distributing. Um, <clears throat> you can keep track of course of uh, all of these resources and many other things uh, through the Powered Up Baraboo website and we'll let everybody know when this recording is available. Um, I'd ask that everybody maybe turn off uh, your video also uh, to make sure that uh, there are no issues there and mute yourselves. And if you have questions that occur to you during the presentation, uh, please put them in the chat box, uh, which you should be able to find um, <clears throat> at the bottom of your um, Zoom screen. And I will keep track of those questions and then can field them, uh, put them together and um, ask Torrance those questions at the end, unless we continue to have a pretty small group, in which case we'll just open it up. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll introduce our speaker tonight, Torrance Kramer, who's uh, going to talk about home performance testing, energy audits, uh, and procedures, and common failings. Uh, so Torrance has extensive field experience conducting uh, comprehensive energy assessments on all building types, uh, from single family homes to schools to multifamily complexes. And he's used his training in energy management to promote optimum building performance and train many others to do the same. He's a certified energy manager, a building analyst, and, uh, and leadership in energy and environmental design professional. Uh, and for the last uh, little more than seven years, Torrance has operated accurate airtight exteriors, which completes energy audits, as well as weatherization repairs of most building types. So Torrance, welcome. Uh, and thank you for pre presenting to Powered Up Baraboo. For sure, glad, glad, to, uh, glad to share some knowledge. Uh, this is the kind of thing that gets me fired up. So as we were talking earlier, uh, Barry, I've, I've done a lot of presentations over the years. Uh, this is definitely in the hundreds of um, presentations I've offered. Uh, this presentation I've uh, given similar to, uh, similarly to other organizations, in fact, another Baraboo organization as well. So I'm glad I get the chance to share this with you as well. Um, been working in energy efficiency for almost 20 years now, doing you know, everything from energy audits to blower door testing to some you know, really unique stuff I've gotten to do over the years with um, you know, Department of Energy and the military and what have you. So I've got a pretty vast experience in energy audits of all types. Um, but this presentation today, we're going to talk specifically about residential energy auditing. I do have multiple energy auditors on my staff, um, as well as multiple teams that come out and look at buildings and repair buildings, find ways we can make buildings more energy efficient. We're going to talk about ways we can make your home more energy efficient, whether that is, you know, through that energy out process, the knowledge that you gain through that, or the physical work that a team like my company or others out there might come and do to find those gaps, cracks, 
look at your furnace, your boiler, your windows, your lights, the many different things that consume energy around your house. All right, so hang on a second here, having a little technical difficulties. Moving the page through. So a little bit about my company, um, beyond what I talked about, we are a focused energy trade ally. So that's the type of company that you would typically want to work with, whether it's myself or another you know, uh, uh, company out there. Uh, focus on energy trade ally means that they are required to uphold a particular standard. Um, you know, other folks can come out and say, yeah, they're insulators, but are they adhering to the Building Performance Institute um, or the focus on energy type guidelines to make sure you're actually getting a quality project out there? Um, our company, we do work in commercial and residential, both the testing and the consulting side of it. Uh, so prior to turning on the computer a few minutes ago, I actually was writing a proposal uh, to evaluate the, the building envelope, the building shell of a 35-story high-rise being proposed in Milwaukee, and then everything in between. Um, and we also do the repair sides of it. Last week, I did a blower door test on a very large commercial structure. Um, won't get into too much detail, but you know, long story short, I own the largest blower doors in the country. I was able to test a very large facility in uh, Beloit. Some people might be familiar with. It's called the Ironworks Building. Uh, really neat old factory that they turned into office spaces, and we evaluated where the leaks were in that building. And then they're going to propose to the owners that we come back and actually do the work for them too. Uh, so lots of cool stuff out there that we get into. Um, but as far as your home, you know, an energy audit is a good place to start. Uh, we have different variations that we offer. And what that is about is energy audit is whatever you call it. Um, I used to do energy audits when I first started my career and it was me and a clipboard and a pen and a flashlight. And I was basically looking at what could possibly be done, but only from my visual perspective. But then you take it to the other end where you're incorporating something like this blower door behind me in this picture here and the infrared camera picture here, turning on that fan, finding that air leaks and, and uh, getting more comprehensive about really figuring out what's going on in the building. Maybe you're looking at uh, the, the equipment in the house as well. How efficient is the boiler or the water heater or the furnace? How efficient is the lighting? How efficient uh, are the windows and the refrigerator or what have you? So an energy audit is about the depth. What depth of involvement and diagnosis is actually happening in that? And that could also then tailor what said costs might be to do said energy audit. I'm going to be a little challenged here about flipping through the screens I can see. So having a contractor or at least a consultant that's building Performance Institute is the starting point. If a energy auditor doesn't have that certification, uh, I might honestly look elsewhere. Here's the other opposing uh, certifications out there in the residential energy auditing world. Well, BPI is kind of uh, taking the cornerstone, or maybe that's not the right terminology, but uh, they are the leading guide for uh, certified professionals that will look at residential buildings and analyze them for energy efficiency improvement. So it's Building Performance Institute, BA, Building Analyst typically. Um, I also personally have the MF, Multifamily uh, Analyst Certification as well. Uh, part of my background was analyzing multifamily residential buildings for uh, almost seven years finding out ways that they could be more energy efficient. So lots of different options through BPI, but the corner for you, uh, if you're gonna do residential energy audit is to make sure that that auditor is BPI, BA certified. So things in an audit, combustion safety testing. You're gonna go and tighten up your building, make it more energy efficient. It is crucial that you check to make sure that the combustion appliances, something like this water heater here, is actually sending the carbon monoxide out of the house rather than when you turn on a dryer or some exhaust fan, spilling it back into the house. This can be very detrimental to health uh, if that is not uh, verified before and after the work is done. Even with something like this, where you have a sealed combustion unit, it doesn't have this bell housing in the house. It actually directly vents to the outside. I've tested multiples of these where they were actually failing as I was testing them and had to have immediate change outs that evening 
uh, to ensure that they still had heat through the night. One of them happened to be on uh, Thanksgiving evening at two o'clock in the afternoon before Thanksgiving. Uh, they were able to get out there, change out the furnace and had a new furnace up and operational by six o'clock that night, set up so they could have their Thanksgiving dinner the next morning. Um, otherwise they would have been without Thanksgiving dinner. Um, so blower door, this is that key component in an energy audit. Think of it like a box fan you put in the window, but you know, big red door we put in the front door. Turn that on, depressurize, hence suck the air out of the house. But as that air gets sucked out of the house, the air comes back through the gaps and cracks that the house has. Then we're able to take that infrared camera and look and see where those differences are. Plus, we have a small computer hooked up to that called a manometer that will validate uh, and, and tell us what the total flow, how much air, how big of a leak do we actually have? We can quantify and say, oh, the leak is as big as the the window or the front door or what have you. So here's an example of a you know, visual image, just looking at this corner here, looks innocent enough. Customer told me, you know what? It's always kind of cold right over here. Every time I walk off the carpeting, it's really cold right here. Well, I had the infrared camera on that and sure enough, you could see that there's a significant temperature difference right there. Well, that was a cantilevered overhang. So basically if you were outside of the house, you can kind of reach your arm up underneath of there. The insulation has kind of fallen and you know, there's air migrating through there causing a cold space. Had you know, not been able to go outside because the snow was too high or something like that, just a visual inspection without the blower door, without the infrared camera, this might not have been as intuitive. Um, you know, customer told me to look in that direction, plus had the infrared camera going, ended up being pretty obvious. So common problems, you know, things like an attic hatch, recess lights. Newer homes, lots of recess lights typically in newer homes. They tend to leak pretty heavily. So this is where that heat will leave the building. You know, you always hear heat rises. Well, sort of. Um, cold air will come in the bottom. So whatever goes out the top of the straw, something must come in the bottom of the straw. So things like a dryer vent or electrical penetrations, things like that, or the sill boxes, these little wooden boxes right here at the top of the foundation will often draw lots of air in. All right, so back to my statement of heat rising. Well, sort of. If the attic is very hot because it's summertime, you got air conditioning going on inside of the house, temperatures go from hot to cold. So in return, this attic heat will actually leach into the house. And in many cases, especially you know Cape Cod colonial style homes can draw in an awful lot of heat uh, into this upper levels, causing it to be relatively intolerable because of the amount of heat that's migrating from the attic and into the building. You take a very tall building, yes, heat's going to rise, heat's going to go out the top, it's going to act more linear like a straw would, and you're going to have that draw on the base of the house. So there's common gaps and cracks, you know, things like the soil stack or exhaust pipes right here will commonly let air out. A lot of houses will have, you know, weird gaps and cracks in the attic. You don't see them because there's fuzzy stuff over them. Well, you pull up the fuzzy stuff, you see all this blackness that's on that insulation. That's the air that's been migrating through that insulation for many, many years. You know, I'm sure you've looked in a ray of light and you've seen dust at some point. Well, think of 20 years of dust migrating through a big hole like this. They can fill that with you know, a rigid foam board or a piece of drywall and some caulk or something like that. And all of a sudden we're saving energy very quickly. These are things that are identified during an energy audit. So what, what's happens if we don't seal things like this. Well, yeah, we lose money. You know, that's one thing. Um, another thing is that moisture can migrate out of these holes, especially if there's, say, a shower underneath of here. Now, all of a sudden, we get icicles. We got icicles hanging in the attic. Or if it doesn't get cold enough up here for it to condense because there's so much heat loss, well, now we could have, you know, pretty to look at, but not so good for your house, ice dams. So what is an ice dam? Well, the heat's migrating out of the attic, causing, like I said, you know, potentially icicles in the attic, or if it gets really hot up here, like I've seen many times before, um, you know, you've got this ice starting to build up and it'll start to dam. That ice will, uh, that water will melt, come down, hit the gold gutters, and then start to freeze and then back its way up and underneath the shingles. And then if it's bad enough, sometimes you'll see moisture dripping down the walls or coming over top of a window or, you know, something along those lines and you know can be quite catastrophic frankly uh, i was looking at a property the other day 
um, where they had um, substantial heat loss coming out of the building. But then one day the wind kicked up and actually blew the wind into the house at a big cap and crack right here. And there happened to be a, a sprinkler pipe right underneath of that. Sprinkler pipe actually froze and uh, caused it to burst and sp spilled all over their house. Um, I've seen this before, um, you know, where there's so much moisture up in the attic from this constant freeze thaw mentality where the entire roof deck's just covered with mold. Um, you know, these are the things that can be avoided by properly you know, plugging holes uh, like we see here, you know, just some real basic stuff. Every house has some level of gap, gap and crack in it. It's just a matter of how bad. You know, my house is probably one of the tightest houses in Madison, and I still have some gaps and cracks. Um, they're, you know, needles and haystacks is the way I look at it, and you're just never going to get all of them. But getting it closer to tight is where you want to be. So one thing that arises, questions people ask regularly, well, don't houses have to breathe? Well, no, people have to breathe. The house has to be ventilated. That's a bath fan or, you know, go to the extent of something like an energy recovery ventilator, air to air exchanger. So this particular image here, uh, I was in an attic, it was 20 degrees outside. And this is just a cheapy $14 thermometer uh, pointed down at the hole and it was 63 degrees in the attic. Think how much heat that's gonna pop up into the attic, how much snow that'll melt how much ice damming that could cause. And then how many dollars are you spending? Those types of items have a very quick return on investment. Insulation is a little bit longer and anywhere from five to 15 years return on investment. Uh, quite often air sealing can be just a couple of years. And if you're doing it yourself, it could be almost instantaneous. Uh, I remember a presentation I gave many years ago and somebody had stood up in the back of the room and said, listen to this guy, listen to this guy. I spent $15 last week on a, a hole he plugged, or last month. I spent $15 on a hole last month that Torrance recommended to seal up and I saved $50 the next month. And it was simple to me. I saw a hole this big where I was up in his attic and I was basically able to look down into his lobby space, small multifamily property, and you know immediate savings. Well, he then pursued a much larger project and plugged up many, many larger holes after that. So as we talked about, well, what happens if you don't plug the holes? So this was actually a friend of mine's house. He was very excited to show me his insulation he had just installed. He had the ladder set up for me, sent me to look at his attic, and this is what I found. Well, what happened was he installed plenty of insulation, but he never sealed any of the top plates. He didn't seal those gaps and cracks that were allowing moisture from the house up into the attic. It was cold winter day, that moisture had migrated up and froze on the roof deck. Well, think of what weeks, months, years of this can do to your roof deck um, and any other things up there. You know, it can be significant mold and mildew issues and deterioration of roof deck. Uh, I've seen projects before where they're changing out the roof deck every 10, 15 years, like the entirety of the roof deck because of so much moisture migration up there. So it can have very detrimental effects besides just the energy loss that comes along with it. And then in regards to the environmental impacts of having to reinstall all of that sheathing and roofing and what have you, rather than just doing it right the first time. So the different solutions. So have holes, found holes through an energy audit. You know, you turn on the blower door, use the infrared camera and found out, you know, all these different leaks that you have around the house. Well, now what? Well, let's go about fixing some of them. So chimney chase is one of the more common and one of the larger leaks in a home. So when I was actually working on my home, uh, the small ranch home that I'm in currently, um, I used it as a test case. I would go in the attic and plug a hole and go and turn that blower door on and find out how much leakage I had. And it was very astounding to me to realize how much leakage actually was associated with my chimney chase. 
So most chimneys will have a small chase around them. It's code that there is a gap between the chimney and the wall nearby to it. And that's if that chimney ever got too hot, it wouldn't start the house on fire because there's a gap there. Well, that gap cannot be filled with insulation. It cannot be filled with this foam board. The only thing you can fill it with is sheet metal and fire caulk. That's it. It's the only thing you can put in there. Don't believe the stories of fire foam. That's what this stuff is right here. It says in the can, fire foam. It's not allowed to be near high temperature settings. It's a meant that it can be in high temperature rooms, but it can't go up against high temperature surfaces. Um, so in this particular space, you know, we filled that big gap all the way around, some sheet metal, some fire caulk, and saved a bunch of energy. This is very common of what we'll do over, say, a top plate um, and a drop soffit situation. So many homes over top of your cabinet, so you have your kitchen cabinet, and above it, there's that little gap or that, that drop ceiling space right there called the drop soffit. Quite often in the attic, you can look down into that drop soffit and actually look down to the walls. And if you were to drop a penny in there, it would fall to the floor of the first floor. Um, so that allows a lot of air to migrate up in there. The kitchen is one of the most porous areas of the house. You've got lots of screws to hold up all of the cabinetry. You got more plumbing, typically more electric. And then all quite often, especially in homes that are uh, post 1980, uh, you won't find drywall behind that cabinetry. Why? We're never gonna see it, says the contractor. Well, why? Because of air. Air's still gonna migrate through that siding, not be totally sealed up by that cabinetry, and be able to migrate into the house. And if that wall is then attached to a drop soffit, well, now we've got a big gap. That'll make the butter freeze, that'll make the cups cold. So we come in, we find that drop soffit, covered it with foam board and one part foam, great stuff, as many of you are familiar with. And all of a sudden we sell the big gap. Pretty simple, pretty easy. And those are the kind of things that save a lot of energy. So I talked about earlier, recessed cam lights. Uh, a lot of newer homes have an awful lot of these. Most of them will leak a lot of energy. They'll move a lot of air. They'll have anywhere from a dime to a quarter size hole that'll move air from the house through the recessed can light into the attic. So we come in with these fire retardant insulated and air sealed covers. I call them Dr. Zeus hats. Put the Dr. Zeus hat over top of the hole, foam it in place. We basically, we bump the ceiling up and over top of the can light now. And now that can light doesn't move air any longer. So sill boxes, another leaky spot. So you can see in our infrared camera, so we had the blower door going here. We had the infrared camera on it. We got 63 down to 48.3 uh, degrees. Don't remember the temperature that day, but I'm going to assume uh, it was someplace in the low 40s to high 30s. And you can see all the different temperature spots on there. So from a digital visual, if we had a digital image of this, you would see where these little spots are here in the middle, basically where the insulation was kind of depressed. It was kind of pushed in there too hard, not performing like it should. But then you see how it's really cold around the perimeter here. That's because there's a lot of air coming through there. So in your sill box in your basement here, you've got this little gap that runs the length here of the two by four, two by six that sits on the foundation. You got a gap here and around where this uh, um, uh, runner sits on top of the uh, 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 sill, box, sill plate there. And then you've also got your flooring sitting on top of this beam. Gap, gap, gap. All different little gaps and cracks that could be sealed. And a newer one that I've discovered in the last four or five years is that these little areas right here, we actually need to seal too. So now it's common process for us when we have a flooring system like this that we actually take the foam and we'll extend it down these little lines right here because otherwise the air actually will go through this or this is a better picture, I guess, right here. The air will migrate down this line and out the hole and out the side of the house. So now we actually shove the foam back in there to make sure that's airtight. Here we've got about four inches of spray foam. Our value, about our 28 or so traditional fiberglass over here, R11. But with the air migrating through that fiberglass, it actually will perform closer to like an R3, 4, or 5 versus the R28 we get here. Then additionally, when we put that spray foam in there, we get to keep the varmints out too. 
So we're keeping the energy in and keeping the varmints out. Cellulose, my preferred type of uh, blown insulation, recycled cardboard and paper, got a fire retardant material in it, put a blow torch right on it. I like that it's recycled, it's not a virgin material, so better for the environment. Um, and my guys really like it because they can be in there without gloves on because it's not itchy. So we're recycling something, insulating our house with it, and it's well protected. And with that borate, that fire retardant, it inhibits mold and pests don't like it either. Things like attic hatches, we've got a blower door on here. Look at that, 31 degrees. And you can see these little spikes coming out of here. That's actually when we got the camera with the blower door. We're seeing the air. We're actually seeing the air come out of that uh, attic hatch. So an easy thing to weather strip and put a bunch of foam on like we do here. We taped it up and you throw this foam board at the wall basically and it'll hold tight forever. Um, and then weather stripping properly around the gap, around the perimeter. Or a typical door like this, you know, we button nailed it, screwed that on, we weather stripped around the perimeter, we put a sweep on the bottom here. Some cases we'll actually put a little extension on the door handle so we can you know, take that foam out even further. Um, if you're going to not put the insulation here, but put it across the top of the opening of the stairwell, well, now these walls become uh, space between inside outside. You say that right? No, I said that backwards. If you're putting the foam here, these walls need to be insulated now because this attic access actually becomes outside. So your walls need to be insulated and your stair treads need to be insulated. Versus if you put the insulation at the top of the stairwell, well, now the wall becomes inside to inside. We don't have to worry about this door any longer, what have you. Um, different methodologies, and that's part of what an energy audit goes through as well, is kind of figuring out what the best pathways, what the best plan is for doing these types of projects. Focus on energy, so you talked about it briefly. Um, if you heat your house with natural gas versus LP, um, and, and also electric would also qualify, there's money available to do work. Um, you do have certain minimums you have to do. Typically, you have to either do a wall insulation or an attic insulation project. But with that, you could be able to access not only $350 for the attic insulation, but an additional $450 for air sealing, $300 for wall insulation, and $100 to do the sill boxes. There are certain minimums, certain requirements, what have you. You can discuss that in more detail during an energy audit. Um, and also, you can go to the focusandenergy.com website and find out more information that way, too. Um, keys with an energy audit are lower door test, as we've talked about, combustion safety, and hey, you get a pretty cool report, too. Most uh, contractors, uh, consultants have a reasonable report, kind of describe some of the issues um, and, and guide you through the different process of fixing up the home. So, you know, why air seal? Why insulate? Well, let's reduce cost, extend life of the home. We talked about some of the crazy damage that we've seen, reduce moisture, uh, pest control, uh, comfort, you know, seal low, keep the, keep the floor warm. You know, seal it at the top. It's like putting your thumb over the top of the straw. You keep that energy inside of the building. So we'll also go through a few DIY options here. So weather stripping, simple things that can be done. Um, I don't like the sticky type. My preference is that we get something that's called a Q lawn. So it makes like kind of a little weird looking Q thing here. Um, so this is something you would a screw into your, your attic access door, your weather stripping, your front door. You can pick these up at Home Depot, Menards, or what have you. They've got these little holes in here uh, that are uh, oval shaped, so you can slide them to nicely fit them into place. Uh, but that's, you know, a quick, easy, do-it-yourself option, something you can get started with right away and start saving energy. Um, or these door sweeps. They've got the kind where you can actually screw into the side of the door. You don't really like those. Uh, reason being is they just wear out very quickly and you just don't get quite the same seal as something like this that has three to five tabs on the bottom. Uh, once one of those tabs breaks, you've got another tab to still back up. Uh, so if you're going to go out and purchase that, I would look for this type. Um, if you don't have good clearance underneath, you do have to pop the door off. Uh, and then there's three to five screw holes in the bottom and you can put this in in about 20 to 30 minutes. Big comfort improver and you'll save a little bit of energy too. <coughs> All right, so something like this. 
So I see a lot of homes that have that addition or what have you. It's quite often like a sunroom or something where there's this tongue and groove. They tend to be the leakiest part of the building. And frankly, can be quite costly for somebody like myself to do when you know the operation is running a cock gun. So where are the leaks in here? Where a wall comes to a wall, any place you put a trim over for access like a door, uh, roof wall junctures, ceiling wall junctures, things like that. Well, why is that? Behind here, there's probably plastic if it was a new enough building, and hopefully insulation as well. The problem is most often the plastic isn't sealed right here. So in return, if this trim piece were coming off, you'd see the butt end of the plastic and the air can now migrate around that plastic and let the air out or let the air in, depending on which direction part of the building it's in. So caulking here and here, 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 and any other little trim locations will save a fair amount of energy. Well, windows and doors are kind of similar. A lot of people want to take this trim off and foam behind there. Yes, that's a great way to do it other than it's very time consuming <laughs> and taxing. <coughs> and you might possibly damage the trim as well. And, and frankly, have to be a little bit more handy to do that. However, you can come in and get a majority of the ceiling by coming and caulking here, and then the other side of that trim, and basically using that trim to seal up that hole, uh, but you gotta seal the trim in itself. Uh, windows and doors are a good way to go about that. So if you have an area that's uncomfortable, that's an option you can go after. A lot of people will ask me, well, what about my windows? My window is really consuming a lot of energy. Well, yes, they, they can consume a fair amount of energy. Will you save a ton of energy by replacing them? If you're looking for something with a reasonable return on investment, you're gonna be looking at anywhere from 20 to 40 years to replace those windows and get that energy savings back in the um, the, the replacement cost of the window for the energy you saved. Um, even the worst window out there, that single pane weighted window, what have you, to turn around and replace those in energy savings alone, you're still looking at about a 20 year investment. There's a lot of ways you can make that work better by caulking, by looking at um, opening up those window weight cavities and getting those better insulated. Um, by doing something called pulley seals, the pulleys that are in there, they're these little seals that you stick over top and actually will seal those gaps and cracks up, um, making that single pane perform much better. But if the window's rotted or doesn't open and close well, you know, it's, uh, you know we got aesthetic issues, well, then blatantly it's a good opportunity. And it look at it as the final frontier of energy efficiency. If you've done all the weatherization and what have you, um, you don't have aesthetic attachments to those windows, then you know, maybe a good option to actually replace those single pane windows out. Another easy one, sealing up the outlets. You know, so here's an infrared image of blower door on, and you can see the air just gushing out behind these outlets. Well, they make these nice little gaskets that you can stick in there and seal them up. One thing a lot of folks don't realize though is you really should be caulking those in place before you put them on. So that way they are sealed fully. And then the other part here. Um, is when you get these gasket, it actually has the circles uh, that you're popping out. So this little circle you pop out. You actually keep that part, take the things so the babies don't stick their finger into the outlet, put the gasket over it, put that back in place. So now you've actually sealed the, uh, the mouth of the man here, if you will, uh, with that piece that you popped out. Nice, easy, simple option uh, to get some quick energy savings. Smart thermostats, something you can regulate when you leave the house. Oh, I forgot to turn the thermostat down. Pop, 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 you can turn it down. And then there's also the convenience that goes along with that, coming home from a long trip and the option to be able to go, what? I'm on my way home and you can turn it up very quickly. It starts to learn your rhythms and you, you adjust uh, like the two on the right as if you would an old mercury thermostat. And it starts to learn what your behaviors are over time and will start to adjust the thermostat accordingly. Um, you can set that up just like a programmable thermostat for vacations and you know, typical work schedules, things like that. Uh, but after a, a short period of time, it really starts to learn your behavior. The longer that it 
has to learn behavior, the more it starts to learn vacations and you know, many of the other oddities that you may have. The Thursday night choir practice, it will start to learn that over time. That actually does have a motion sensor, well, most do anyways. So it knows that, huh, nobody's been around, the lights are off, huh, nobody's here. Turns the thermostat down accordingly uh, and you get energy savings that way and you don't have to think about it. This is one of my favorites, adjusting the water heater temperature. I don't know how many audits I've done over the years and adjusted or checked a homeowner's water temperature and it's at 140 or something, something along those lines. Well, the dishwasher says I have to keep it at 140. Well, most dishwashers have their own heater in it. So in return, use the heater, keep the water heater down to a reasonable temperature. Um, most people can't take a shower much over 120 degrees. Um, and so, you know, drawing that down, uh, some quick, easy savings with, you know, something you can adjust, you can do as soon as we're done here. So hopefully I get some savings before the night's over. Um, other things you could do with that is, you know, wrapping that water heater, insulating the pipe, especially that first six feet. That's really where your big savings is. And the water heater is just that first six feet of the hot side. Um, and then there's also a, uh, uh, restrictor valves, so it's not the right term. Um, some valves that you put at the top of the water heater that actually have a float valve, that's what I was looking for, um, that have a small ball in them that doesn't allow the water to circulate back and forth. It'll actually, that little ball keeps, in, uh, keeps the water down inside of the water heater. Um, if you are electric and you have the option to switch over to natural gas, not only uh, energy savings, but some significant dollar savings too. For every therm of electricity, you pay nearly uh, three times that of what you would in natural gas. Granted, if you're setting up for solar, well then maybe the opposite story. Maybe you do wanna go electric so you can switch everything electric and you can be all solar. Uh, so different story depending upon what your objective are and you know where you are. So this house had the most recessed can lights I have ever seen. They had like 25 or 30 in their kitchen alone. And you could see every last one of them was bleeding heat from the attic. Uh, had the blower door on, uh, sucking that heat in from the attic. And you know this isn't the lights that are turned on here. This is just heat migrating from the attic. So back to the Dr. Zeus hats, you know, that's a, something maybe you don't want to take on yourself. But you can go get these LED retrofits um, or an option of something called a slim. But these basically are glorified light bulbs. See, they screw in right here and then they pop in. They got these little uh, uh, pivot arms, uh, lack of a better term, um, you know, pins basically that'll lock them in um, and start saving energy right away. Not only from the reduced electricity of the light bulb, but also we just plugged a big hole. But much like the uh, gaskets for the outlets, clock it right around the perimeter here before you put that in place. Switching those light bulbs out. <clears throat> Things have came a long way um, from incandescent. I don't know how many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of CFLs I've screwed in over the years to then switch out to LEDs. And I remember when LEDs used to be $50 a light bulb, and now we can get them three for a dollar. And the technology in LEDs has even come along a long ways in the last few years, where quite often there's option of energy efficiency wise of swapping out your LEDs for new, more efficient LEDs. I still prefer to keep my older ones in the name of sustainability and we'll let them, you know, draw down. In fact, I've still got plenty of CFLs around my house, but I don't have an incandescent anywhere to be found. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I hope you got a couple questions for me. Otherwise, I got plenty more we can talk about. There's my contacts. Any questions, anybody? Thank you very much, Torrance. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a couple. And we're a small enough group. Uh, why doesn't everybody, anybody who feels comfortable enough, go ahead and cure your video? Um, and feel free to unmute. Uh, if anybody's got a 
<clears throat> pen handy, please take down. Uh, I can forward Torrance's contact, but um, we could probably go to gallery view and so folks can see one another a little bit. Um, Torrance, I'll start out with a question for you. Um, so I like the, uh, uh, so we did, you, your firm did an energy audit on my home last year. Oh, and one right. of the most, Hunter was out there, yeah. Hunter, yeah. Hunter was out there, did a great job. And what was really interesting about the final report, which I'll vouch for the fact that they're incredibly detailed was that um, of the suite of different things I could have undertaken, not the, all of them had re, marginal at best re, uh, reasonable rates of return. So basically what I'm asking for is sort of your opinion. Where does a project that you would identify rather than a glaring hole, <laughs> um, where does it sort of hit the sweet spot for you? Where you really like, yeah, I really coach you to take, you know, this project on. Um, you know, how many years basically, and could you define for folks sort of what that output is? Um, you know, for, sure. with regards to rate of return and the costs that you know, for example, you'd uh, estimate as. Um, as the fix or how much say a DIY, a DIY project would be, things like that. All right, yeah, pretty kind of loaded question. So, you know. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but no, that's fine, bear with me and, um, um, you know, make, make sure that I elaborate this in the way that you're looking for. So I've worked with the utilities for many years, used to be a utility guy for many years. And where we would often draw the line was at five years. And I hear that regularly from homeowners. I'm only gonna be here for five years or what have you. And, and, and in the business world, quite often, five or 10 years are typically those two key dates, if you will. Um, so if it's an under a five-year payback, that's kind of almost a no-brainer. And the things that would fall underneath of that quite often are air sealing, especially if it's DOIY, it could be almost immediate. Um, even just doing just a comprehensive air sealing project on a house, um, you know, hiring a contractor will quite often have a six months or a two year payback, you know, very quick. What kind of savings from something like that? Anywhere from uh, 12 to 20% of your natural gas bill can be saved through a good air sealing project. Um, and that's a good one. Um, you know, on average, you're probably looking at about 10 year, or, or sorry, 10% uh, uh, of your gas bill uh, saved through doing an air ceiling project. Uh, that being said, though, uh, we did a multifamily project years back where we actually, we achieved 60% on the first go around, and we achieved another 20% on the second go around. We, we cut their gas bill by 80%. We plugged a lot of holes. Um, but, you know, 10 to 15 percent, easy shaking a stick at. Um, certain houses, though, bode weather or bode better for ability to save energy through an air sealing project. Cape Cods are one of the easiest to knock it over the fence. Uh, there's usually just substantial problems associated with what we call knee wall attics. So little tiny triangular walls on the side. And really the issue concerns with them is their interconnection under the floor to the attic. Quite often they're designed where they're kind of outside spaces, you know, like an attic ventilated. Um, and then that air will migrate underneath of that floor system into the house, uh, especially in the, in the summertime. Those homes can often be very difficult to even inhabit upstairs because there's so much heat that migrates under the floor system and into that upper upper attic area or that upper living space area. Uh, that can be blocked off. Just that air sealing project alone, just blocking that floor system off can have an almost immediate payback, substantial energy savings um, and relatively low investment, frankly. Uh, somebody could do this themselves with some rigid foam board and some one part foam. Uh, it's very similar to the same concept. If a person wanted to do the do-it-yourself version of doing their sill boxes, cut the foam board into the pieces, 
stuck it into the cavity, foam around it, insulated and air sealed. Same concept, just up, up a floor. Okay, great. Um, has that answered your questions? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, uh, Rick, are you, do you wanna ask your question that you put into the chat or would you like me to take that on? One of our attendees had a question about radon. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, so how, how is, you know, work that your, uh, your group is doing, how does that sort of interface with radon mitigation? Sure, that's um, a great question. So I actually, um, I worked with the Energy Center of Wisconsin uh, many years ago on a radon study, a national radon study through the uh, Department of Energy. And it was looking at what the effects of radon in homes was due to weatherization projects. And the findings were frankly kind of astounding. Um, in homes that had significant radon issues and did not have a radon system, it actually did increase the radon. In homes that had high radon levels with crawl spaces with dirt floors and went through proper weatherization, the radon went down significantly because part of the weatherization process is cover the floor up with some plastic, adhere it to the wall, basically trap that radon underneath of it. Right. Well, if you add, on, add in a radon system to a weatherized home, now we are significantly having the ability to drop the radon even further because the radon system now actually has a smaller area to reduce the radon on. Then add to the fact that the radon is drawing, or sorry, the radon system is drawing the air down. It is drawing air through the rest of the house to the basement and indirectly dehumidifying the basement. So the optimal system is yes, weatherize, yes, install radon system. You get the best of both worlds. You get the reduction in radon and you get that added benefit of reducing the moisture in the basement. Great. So part of your question really kind of alludes to, you know, something I didn't get into grave detail early on, but the house is a system. You, you know, modify one thing, you are now making an effect in another part of the building. Right. And that's part of that energy audit of having a qualified professional is somebody that can think through that process from front to end and make sure that you are gradually stepping through the weatherization process and getting the uh, best quality product at the end. Uh, the way I describe this to a lot of people, uh, weatherization is the process is much like a funnel. Most people can't take and bring that all the way down to that graduated level. 80, 20, you get 20% of your investment here, but you get the bulk of the energy savings and performance out of it. Get that last little bit, you're gonna spend 80% to get that last 20. Most people quite often can't afford to spend to get the first 20. So they take little slices out of it. But that first slice is the fattest slice. And you slowly work your way through it, but working through that modification, you're making changes to the house uh, that has to be thought through because the building is a system. Anybody else have any questions? Unmute. Yeah, I, oh. I'm unmuted, aren't I? Oh yeah. Yep, we can hear yep. you, Jeff. Um, I guess uh, I'd like to respond to the question about radon, first of all, because that's my experience of having accurate air tight in made the house significantly tighter. Um, and our radon level went up from no more than two picocuries to up to six picocuries. And um, so I installed a radon mitigation system. It's, it's now down to two something again. But, um, and yeah, the basement I think is, is drier. So I can respond that my experience 
yeah, I, I don't, yeah, everything is working much better than it used to. Um, the other real interesting thing about uh, making the house tighter is that um, we, our house never went below 30% humidity over the winter. And a lot of people have to put a humidifier into their house, but because it was so tight, we, we had no problem. And, and uh, you know, other houses I've lived in that were newer <laughs> leaked a lot more than our old house. You know, that, that humidity really, that, that told a big story to me. Dry uh, house, often the leaky house. Yep. Yeah, the other thing, question I would ask in Torrance's presentation, um, didn't talk about uh, heat pump water heaters. Yep. So maybe you could talk about that. Sure, yeah. So, you know, it's a really good step too if we're looking at going all electric is, is swapping out um, gas, natural gas over to electric. But if you are already electric, to switch from an electric tank type heater to an electric heat pump water heater, you have substantial savings there. Um, and then it also is basically a dehumidifier. So a dehumidifier, a refrigerator, a heat pump, they're all kind of the same piece of equipment to some degree. They move temperature from here to here. Um, and that heat pump water heater has that benefit of substantial energy savings, uh, as well as the dehumidification. Uh, they've come a long ways in the last few decades where now they are uh, suitable for residential applications. Uh, there's many manufacturers out there now of them um, and you know, very solid pieces of equipment. And if you're, again, if you're going solar, that's a good option to uh, you know, start switching over to electricity in an efficient manner. Um, as a follow-up on the heat pump, a water heater, um, what's the effect of put, installing that in a in a house where you're actually using the basement? Because it seems to me the the heat pump is drawing um, heat from that space and then cooling that space. Is that just a is that an accurate observation or not? No, um, well, yes and no. I mean, you're drawing from it, but you're also pumping out the other end. You know, that's the thing with the heat pump. You got heat going one way, you got cooling going the other way. Um, but yes, you'll be drawing temperature from that basement, but you're also producing heat out the other side. But yes, so, you're right. But if you're, if, if, the, if, the, if the floor in your basement isn't insulated from the basement to the first floor, wouldn't you be cooling down the floor as well? Your statement, yes. Okay. And that brings but, me back to, you know, I live in a, other, go ahead. One other point to that. Um, you always hear in, the, in Wisconsin, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Well, that humidity holds temperature. And if you can dry that out, you have more equalized temperature at the same time. Okay. So okay. like a crawl space, for example, that's not, that's not covered, will produce some levels of water vapor. And that vapor will hold temperature, which will make that floor feel much cooler. Okay. So you're dehumidifying with the heat pump and yes, you're dumping temperature, um, but to the way that you will physically feel in the space, it's probably a moot point. Okay, good news. So yeah, cause that's been holding me back, just that idea. So here's a question for you. I, um, we live in a 120 year old house um, we were we are old enough to have gone through the uh, energy crisis of the 1970s. So we, uh, you know, we felt like we were pretty pretty up on doing the responsible things for our totally uninsulated house. Electrical services were horrible. No insulation in the roof. Gaps everywhere. So we we've dealt with quite a few of those things. I don't think we're perfect uh, by any means, but. You know, have you come into contact with houses that, let's say, 30 years ago, people did blown in insulation, things like that, and that's really not addressing the kinds of issues in air sealing and insulation that your firm deals with. So you know, could you comment on 
you know, jobs that you've had where maybe you've had to undo that or you just sort of shake your head and tell people good luck? <laughs> I have seen projects that were months old. I, I was out on an estimate uh, a few weeks back and the house was only three months old. Huh. And they were having uh, extremely cold temperature and ice dam issues already. Um, I have looked at over the course of this winter, at least 10 houses that were uh, built within the last couple of years that needed significant improvement. Um, I actually did one in Sauk City a couple of weeks ago where they couldn't figure out why the closet was constantly at 45 degrees. And I went out and I just ran a tape measure and was able to figure it out for them. Like, well, they built the closet over top of the front stoop. It's on a slab. I never insulated the floor. Uh -huh. You know, and so it's constant. I mean, it's regularly. You know, so I go back to some trainings I used to do. I've trained hundreds, probably thousands of energy auditors over the years. And one of the things I would say to most of them in much dismay is your goal and your job is to put yourself out of work. And they look at me, huh? Well, if we save all the energy, we don't have any work. <laughs> well, but the good news is That's we're going to never be out of work because right. we're never going to save it all. <laughs> You know, so there's lots of work to be had out there, but, you know, they keep uh, producing junk just as fast as we can fix it. Um, I live in Madison and uh, East Washington is just a sea of new high rises that have been built in the last many years. Most of those buildings that were built were built with a 40 year plan. Mm -hmm. 10 plus story buildings with a 40 year plan versus hundred year, I mean, the buildings that I'm trying to work on that I'm trying to create are you know, 100, 200 year buildings. Um, so there's no, no shortage of, you know, poor construction out there, unfortunately. Yeah. Getting better to some degrees, there's more knowledge, there's more people thinking about it, but there's still many people doing it the same way they've always done it and as quick as they possibly can. Sure. Yeah, that kind a, of, uh, oh, go oh. ahead, Marianne. Um, that sort of is a good segue to the question that I had. And, you know, part of Baraboo is um, um, thinking about what we can do on the city level, you know, to promote energy efficiency, et cetera. And um, there is some new, um, new residential construction in Baraboo right now. And um, so I guess my question has to do with um, best practices in energy efficiency for new construction, like, um, um, are contractors in general sh um, showing more interest in energy efficiency or, um, uh, you know, if we were to try to have an impact um, at the city level um, as new construction, you know, is considered, um, what are some of the best practices that, that we could be thinking about promoting? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, a, a lot of the main the things that are going to drive this the most are codes. You know, the requirements must do, push the code, but talk to those officials and let them know that it is a um, uh, something you'd like to see in your community. Um, you know, lobby for better efficiency standards. As far as, you know, the builders, well, supply and demand. So education, make a, make a demand and the builder will supply. As far as you know, modifying the builder, I've seen a lot of builders that have really put good for faith efforts and, and have really put forth effort to improve their skills and be more cognizant of this type of work. But if the homeowner is not going to pay for it, they're not going to build it. So could have the best intentions, but doesn't mean they're going to get the results. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, the biggest drivers are is to push the community and really to lobby for the city to put together some standards um, that'll make a difference. Okay. If not education, education, education. Thank you. Jerry? Yeah, I had a question. Um, 
you were talking about um, heat pump water heaters. Have have they replaced tankless water heaters? You know, I used to hear a lot about tankless water heaters, and every time I talked to a plumber, they would say, "You don't want one of those. It'll just plug up." <laughs> on you. Uh, I've got, I've got, I've had one for twenty years. Yeah, so I don't know about replace. Um, I used to push them heavily with the utilities. It was, you know, one of the first things they wanted out of my mouth was, you know, tankless, tankless. And there's different types of tankless. There's very efficient tankless, and then there's not so efficient tankless. And what I mean, but what I say by not so efficient tankless is, tankless kind of comes in the form of conservation rather than necessarily efficiency. There is efficient options where you can have a 90% efficient tankless uh, water heater, but a high majority about those that were installed were actually only 80%. And their um, selling point is you don't have the tank. You still only unfortunately may have an 80% water heater, which is good if you don't have demand. So the conservation side of it. So if you're not using a lot of water to begin with, well, it doesn't matter whether you have a 40% water heater or 100%, you're not using much water. And then if you turn around and you're not using much water and then you're, you're getting something that doesn't have that tank that needs to be warmed up all the time, you know, the more efficient you are, the better. As far as replacing, I still see them both in the market. Um, the on-demands have come an awful long ways, you know, where they aren't clogging as much and what have you. And a lot of it really just was where the filters were sitting, having them this way versus having them this way. Well, this way, gravity fights you. This way, well, particulates are going to fall out and, you know, much easier to clean. So it's about the type, you know, the improvements in the technology. As far as, you know, my personal promotion of them, I don't really promote them anymore. And my reason is simple. You don't use that much typically. The cons the um, husband, wife, and you know multiple um, kids in the house or what have you, you know showers and bathing and clothing and all that sort of thing will still only typically use twenty to twenty five dollars a month on their water heating needs. Um, that's in worst case. Typically, it's more around the fifteen to twenty dollars. So, all right, you take a standard atmospheric type water heater, which is about 50% efficient, and you switch out to a you know, $3,000 tankless 90% water heater, you got 15, 20 bucks to work with. Let's call it $20. You saved half of that. It's $10. How long does it take to pay back $3,000? $3,000 will do a lot of energy efficiency work. It's a nice down payment on a uh, electric vehicle. It's a good down payment on a solar array. I'd rather see that money put into some place that's going to have bigger impacts and return on investment and actually going to do more towards my carbon footprint. You're yeah, muted. Uh, follow up on the, on yeah. the uh, building codes. It's our understanding that the state legislature sort of sets the basic codes that municipalities have to stay within. Do you know of any municipalities that have created um, more stringent codes, you know, as far as energy efficiency or, or even parallel codes that they can provide incentives to? Are you, are you, do you have very examples common. of that? So it's actually very common. It's very common that um, cities, I don't know as much about municipalities, but it, uh, and I'll get back to why, um, but it's very common that cities will modify their codes um, to be either more stringent or less stringent, depending upon uh, the political climate of the city. Uh, Madison, for example, is more stringent. There are certain uh, areas where we're more stringent than the state. Not by much, but a little bit. You look around the country and you have places like Seattle where their, their uh, city code is extremely more stringent than the state. Um, it's one of the most stringent in the country. And so the state is typically the guideline. Um, it's, the, it's the thumb in the wind to where you need to be. But the city always has the right to amend and modify according to their own code choices. 
So back to the city versus municipality. The challenge with municipalities quite often is their codes are enforced and somewhat created by companies that have been outsourced. So quite often this isn't done in-house, if you will. I don't know about Baraboo, for example, uh, whether that's in-house or you know, whether they're using you know, somebody out of the city uh, to enforce those codes and you know, how those are necessarily created. But there is that option um, of amendments um, in most cities uh, to have more stringent codes. Great. Uh, we have uh, time for one more question. Rick, I think uh, you had your hand raised for a bit now. Yeah, Torrance, you know, I guess I am curious about the difference <laughs> you see between municipalities and cities, because a city is a municipality, technically. There, in municipalities, there's towns, villages, and cities, in my yeah. understanding, but... Uh, um, Big versus get, small, I guess, is all I'm getting at. But oh, yes. gotcha. Uh, you know, probably one of the questions that I've got, Torrance, is, you know, what I, what I've, at least, maybe it's my perception, I'm not sure if it's reality, but it seems like a lot of the people that, that have the, the worst types of, of buildings are, you know, are, you know, as far as energy efficiency and or, you know, weatherization, have the, the least amount of means to be able to afford, either think about affording, um, having an energy audit, um, or knowing about, uh, you know, what the benefits of an energy audit are, do you have, you know, so, you know, there's, you know, issues with equity in, in what people are, are number one, know about, and then number two, have the means to actually do something about, do you have thoughts or suggestions on how best to, to um, address that situation? I don't know if I have thoughts on necessarily how to address, but you know I do have comments on that. So you know if if said um, homeowner or renter is in that you know truly low income scenario, there is weatherization programs available for them. It's the the next tier of income that typically is the biggest sufferer, the low to moderate income. They don't have access to weatherization because they make too much money. Um, and those are typically the most underserved communities. Um, this is something that has been on uh, Focus and Energy's radar for a very long time. Uh, they do have an actually increased incentive uh, for those types of folks where their incentives are almost double. Um, there has been different talk through legislator to legislation to actually increase that, uh, uh, the ability for um, um, incentive programs to pay even more in that direction. Um, and I'm actually uh, in a meeting this Friday with the Midwest Renewable Energy Association about a grant we're trying to pursue uh, in order to get more funding out towards uh, low to moderate incomes. So part of what we're looking at doing is actually doing a study on the impacts of weatherizing 300 of these uh, low to moderate income homes and trying to make the case that, you know, these are the homes that really need the help. Uh, you know, these are the folks that can't even think about it because they don't have the opportunity to go after the weatherization dollars. Um, you know, so how do go about pushing that further. Again, you know, legislation is a big part of that. So we can start attributing more of the, you know, the, um, the whether weatherization dollars or whether the focus on energy rebates towards that homeowner, uh, because they're also often the uh, ones that need it the most. Um, one hope I have is that some of the current federal legislation um, and the monies that are um, um, being directed towards energy efficiency and renewable energy are actually going to be uh, earmarked specifically for that low to moderate income. We don't know where that's going to shake out yet, where that money is going to appear, whether that's going to be solar farms or wherever that money may go, that's going to come down to the um, you know. Public Service Commission and what have you, where they direct that money. But you know, let's cross our fingers that some of that low to moderate income are actually uh, you know going to see some of that funding. 
That's a great, great thought. Well, Torrance, Tor I want to, oh, Marianne, was that you or? That's, that's me, Morgan. I, I oh, was hey, Morgan, to... sure. Sorry, uh, Torrance, you're kind of speaking my language here. I'm the, the director of the Habitat for Humanity that covers your oh. county. And, yeah. uh, and we serve exactly that and we do home repairs. Um, and you're right, the weatherization, that's the majority of what we deal with um, is, is the folks that can't access. So I, I'm just wondering with this, this, this is the first I've heard about this action coming up. Do you know who's advocating on it or, or how I can um, find more information? So I don't know enough about it. I just know enough to be dangerous. So, um, okay. so <laughs> Hope for Homes is the program. It's been, um, I don't know, it's second, third, fourth iteration or what have you. Um, Hope is an African acronym for something. Um, sure. And, you know, part of that is for that promoting uh, the home performance industry. Um, but they're also, you know, part of the advocate team, if you will, uh, for uh, getting more of this energy efficiency dollars out to homes. So okay. unfortunately, yeah, I don't know enough. I just know enough to be dangerous. That's okay. No, it's just exciting to hear there's some action happening. So, thank yeah, you. exactly. Yeah, so that was in this, uh, you know, the recent bill that went through the monster, monster, you know, billion dollar, you know, bunch of bees uh, bill. Yeah, yeah. Big, it was for the, uh, it was for energy. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Torrance, for, uh, presenting to us tonight. Um, very hopeful to get the presentation up uh, to the Powered Up Baraboo website very soon. And we'll get linked in with um, your outlets too. Uh, but yeah, I learned several really great things tonight and very much appreciate your efforts. Absolutely. I appreciate y'all listening to what I had to say and um, you got my contacts uh, if anything arises. Uh, feel free to free to reach out. Um, you know, we, as I said early on, we do comprehensive energy audits as well as you know weatherization projects. And uh, you know, we're definitely in your area on a you know, more consistent and uh, regular basis than we ever.